Welcome to the Maternity and Midwifery Forums, a day of programmes for the International Day of the Midwife. Um, supported by Matflix, we are bringing you a mixture of live programmes with guests from around the world. Um, leadership voices looking at some of the issues that are confronting maternity and midwifery at this uh, very difficult time. Um, I'm joined this morning by uh, the lovely Sue MacDonald, who some of you will recognise as the curator of our brilliant maternity and midwifery festivals. And you can, you can see quite a number of the top 10 video presentations that have been most watched from uh, the catalogue. And I'm also joined by uh, Roy Lilly, uh, who uh, will be well known to many people and has presented at the festivals. Um, Roy, in fact, has uh, for over 50 years since he started his first enterprise. Um, however, he moved sideways from business into the health service in 1989, and him and I have been crossing paths uh, in a variety of different ways for the whole of that time. Uh, Roy is a leading commentator on health services. He runs one of the most entertaining blogs that you could possibly have. Um, he's uh, safely locked down uh, as being an elderly gentleman. Uh, so many people, I can think of a few people, probably quite happy that Roy's locked down, but unfortunately they can't take his computer away from him. Um, what we're going to have today is a series of people who are going to give their reflections on the state of paternity and midwifery at the moment. Uh, it's a very eclectic group. You will hear from some tremendous people. We'll be joined later by Jess Phillips, uh, the MP and Shadow Minister for the Home Office, and she'll be talking about the uh, difficult issue of domestic violence and refuge for women. Later on, we've got Professor Mary Renfrew, uh, Leslie Page, Sue Dow, uh, Anna Byron, and the team from the Practicing Midwife will be doing a session uh, later in the morning, and you can find all of this on the Maternity and Midwifery Forum uh, website. Uh, we've got people from all around the world participating from Brazil, Peru, Canada, Greece, Australia, Spain, the Philippines, Ireland, Ghana, and Uganda. But from Uganda to Surrey, where Roy Lilly is ensconced in his castle. And uh, Roy, welcome to the programme. How are you? Good morning, Neil, and good morning, everyone, and good morning, Sue. Uh, I'm super good, thank you. Actually, um, the... Um, the, the truth is that very early on, I decamped from uh, the leafy Surrey, uh, where I felt a bit sort of on my own and vulnerable. So I'm in my flat now in London, uh, which is uh, just on the river. So I've got a great view of the river. I've got a terrific balcony and I've got uh, some nice gardens as well here to walk in and go to a park. So actually for me, lockdown has been, you know, I've done very well. Um, I miss the sort of going out and, and I miss visiting hospitals and all of that. But, I, but as, as it's gone, I've been really lucky. So you've spoken uh, before at Maternity Midwifery Festivals. You've uh, been involved with NHS Trust. You're very aware of uh, the sheer scale of uh, maternity and midwifery. Some of us were joking earlier that um, it probably had to be explained to some politicians that uh, uh, childbirth was a bit different from other operations, they couldn't quite be postponed or pushed back. Uh, and that during the first three months of this uh, COVID crisis, there was likely to be up to 150,000 births in uh, the UK and uh, something like 600,000 over the whole year. So we could be looking at 450,000 births if, if we're all in various stages of distancing and lockdown for uh, nine months. So. This is a very eclectic uh, program. People can talk about whatever they like. And we've invited Roy to just give us a five minute reflection on any aspect of maternity and midwifery that really uh, he would like to highlight and reflect on. So Roy, over to you. Well, th thank you, Neil. I mean, I think that the first thing I, that occurs to me is, is really how well uh, midwifery has done in, in the midst of the corona crisis, if I can put it like that. I mean, uh, and no one knows what's going on anywhere, really, do we, at the moment? I mean, the whole thing is just a fog, uh, and the daily news things that we get from number 10, they just do statistics and they just go zoom over everybody's head. 
Um, and so getting a real fix on, on what is happening is quite difficult. I, I was um, uh, interviewing the chief executive of the Royal Wolverhampton Trust um, uh, last week, and, and he was telling me there about his maternity services because I knew I'd be on here and I wanted to ask him. And he was saying he'd pretty much left the maternity services to get on with whatever it is they wanted to get on with. And they've done a, a more home births uh, than they would have done normally. So I think you know that's interesting i think um, what that says to me you know we've got a a, a a group of very responsible uh senior uh, uh clinicians who are able to get on and do their own thing which which is the hallmark i think of midwifery and has been uh for as long as i've been involved with it so i i, I mean it'll be interesting when all this is over to tease it out and see actually how well we did do the the other issue for me is that the we've been dumped in this kind of corona mess but if we go back before the corona mess and and think about where we were with midwifery then we were still i think struggling and we were still kind of arguing or, or debating certainly uh, better births um uh, baroness cumberledge's seminal work where she described the gold standard for midwifery the the you know the one woman one midwife throughout the whole of the term uh, and all of the things that we wanted to do we've not been able to do it simply because um mid, a lot of midwives have not been able to take on a 24-hour responsibility for for their women uh, and of course we've not had enough midwives i mean we seem to yo-yo up and down with a number of midwives i think now we're about three thousand short as you say, you know, whatever people have been up to in lockdown, it's highly likely that we're going to need a few more midwives come January, December uh, uh, and uh, the early part of next year. So where we're, I think it, the important thing for me is that we don't let the corona thing distance ourselves from the gold standard and what we were trying to achieve before the corona thing came along. And I think that's going to need a, a big uh, 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 act of leadership to take the midwives back to where they were, that we need to say, you've done a terrific job during the corona crisis. Uh, and, you know, a, a lot of things have had to have been compromised and we've done things practically that perhaps we don't really want to do. And somehow or other we've come through it and we've got through this elegantly and well done. But let's go back to where we were trying to achieve and then think, okay, how do we get from the, uh, the, the, the better births ambitions and bring them now into an uncertain future? Now, there are two things about the future that I, I would just like to, to mention, if I may. The first is uh, we don't know where we're going to be with the money because it depends on the economy. Now, we all know the economy is shot to pieces. And how that's going to recover, I don't know. I mean, we, I, this is not the morning to get into the technical aspects of the recovery of the economy, but either we've got to borrow it from overseas or, or we've got to put up taxes. It looks to me like it's going to be a mix of the both. That then says to me, OK, what happens to public services? We've just gone through 10 years of austerity from 2008 after the world banking crisis. We've had pretty much flatline funding in the last 10 years. We thought we were on track to get additional funding, and certainly the government has been generous to the NHS in so far as it's funded pretty much everything it's needed for the corona crisis. But what will the government's attitude be to funding public services after the corona crisis? Do we need to prepare ourselves for another period of not austerity, austerity then certainly not uh, anything like the 4% per annum that we've been is, is our historical average. What that means for maternity services, I don't know, but I do think that maternity, that uh, midwifery leaders should be thinking about what will funding look like after uh, when we get through all this, and that's probably going to be another, I don't know, it could be nine months. And finally, I just want to say uh, that I've been a great proponent, Neil, as you know, for the use of technology in healthcare. Not recklessly. I think we need to look after people's data and we are having all the palaver now about the NHS app. But fundamentally, I think that's a good thing. Data is the, is, is the new future. And in addition to that, I've been really interested to see how 
clinicians' behavior has changed. Now, I've been trying to get uh, clinicians to do online and video co uh, conference calling with patients for the last 30 years. And it's, it's happened in three weeks because of the corona thing. So I've seen my ambitions fulfilled in three weeks. Now, I, I don't know what that's meant uh, for midwifery, uh, but I do know there have been some fantastic apps that have been developed. There, there was one that came out of Nottingham um, uh, before the corona thing, and there have been several others where women have been able to engage with their midwives in a, in a more sort of social way, in a more, in a regular accessible way. And of course, you know, the majority of women that have babies are around 30, they will be, uh, or younger, and they will be net savvy. They'll be able to cope with uh, IT and what have you. And so the other question then that, that I think is open for midwifery leaders is the extent to which they can engage with their mothers and their women using technology which i think is the step change if anything good comes out of this and god knows uh, so much death and misery has come out of the corona crisis but if any good can come out of this then it must be the uh, the use of technology so there there are my three things it's we mustn't forget better births uh, and the gold standard that we were aiming for we mustn't forget the impact on the economy and what that will mean for the whole of the service, not least midwifery, and what does technology mean for us in the future? Now that we have actually used a lot of these technologies, can we take the best of it in the future? So there are my three reflections. Um, well, let's just pick up on the technology point, um, because in the reports that we've been getting on the midwifery hour um, that Sue uh, runs every week, um, one leading midwife consultant said that exactly the point you made, that they'd managed to get through an online service in about a week that we've been asking for for two years. But one question that will arise when that goes, will that go backwards, is that there, is a, there are, of course, a lot of regulations around how you communicate with uh, patients and mothers. There are lots of data protection issues. Lots of the things that are happening at the moment in social media uh, do you think we can be confident that um, the health service will be loose enough or uh, social enough to allow professionals to interact on social media or will they want it all to be locked in centrally controlled apps? Well, that's a great qu question, Neil. I mean, if we look at what's happening now, um, uh, for example, with chief executives, uh, they have a WhatsApp group, uh, and WhatsApp, as everyone uses WhatsApp, you will know that it's confidential, it's encrypted, and, and they've been using the WhatsApp group to talk to each other to share PPE. So if someone's short of gloves and someone's got gloves, they've been able to say, you know, um, I, I've got gloves, I'll DHL them to you or whatever. And so th there's been a lot of uh, a very worthwhile dialogue between the chief executives using th those kind of apps. I can tell you now that whatever happens after the CV crisis is over, they won't want to go back and not do that. And if you look at, um, look at patients, not just uh, um, uh, women with uh, uh, pregnant women, but if you just look at patients more generally, we're seeing patients now being seen for outpatients appointments. And the question is, will they want to go back to having to take half a day off of work, drive their car, find somewhere to pay, park, pay five quid for an hour's parking, sit and wait for the clinic that always runs late to go in and have a conversation with somebody they could have done on the phone? You know, GPs, I mean, will we really want to go back? to not being able to watch, to ringing up at, you know, the magic time at 8.30 in the morning and try and get an appointment with a GP on a fortnight. Or are we, do we want to, will we want to stick with actually talking to the GP on FaceTime? And it's the same with women, with their kids. Will they want to go back to trying to get hold of the midwife on the phone or trying to make an appointment or, or, or will they want to do a WhatsApp? Will they want to do a FaceTime? Will they want to have that instant uh, access and of course the answer to that is yes no they won't want to go back so i'm hoping that this will be driven by patients by women by mums and they'll say well hang on a minute you know uh, 
three months ago, I could do this much more easily. I don't think they were going to want to go back. And I think the other thing is this. I think the clinicians have gained a confidence in doing this. I, I will never forget years ago when I first, I wrote a book years ago on telemedicine and it was pretty controversial at the time. And I had to kind of battle my way through audiences with it. And uh, a clinician, wise old guy took me to one side and he said, you know, Roy, you're absolutely right. We should be doing all this. But the thing is, we're not trained to do it. We're not used to just looking at someone on the screen. We're used to watching how someone walks in, how they handle the doorknob, how they sit down. Are they breathless? Where they look? Do they look you in the face? What's their face color? All of this is part of the diagnostic process. We're not trained to do it. Show us how to do it and we'll do it. And I think what has happened is without the training, the experience of this is clinicians have, have been able to do it. They feel safe doing it. The public think it's hugely convenient. And, and I'm running on the, uh, at the moment on the Academy of uh, Fabulous Stuff, which, as you know, is a kind of repository of, of good stuff that uh, the NHS is doing. We're running a thing at the moment called No Going Back. And it's a list of ideas that people have submitted where they've said, we're doing this now. Maybe it's not authorised. Maybe it doesn't fit with the regulations. But I tell you what, there's no going back. Now, you've, um, you mentioned uh, better births and um, the uh, department has put the transformation plan on pause. Lots of the programmes have been paused. But can I just bring Sue in? Because uh, in the midwifery and maternity programmes that she's been doing, even in the face of the crisis, Sue, a number of midwives have been saying that they've had very good, if not improved, relationships with uh, some of their mothers, uh, facilitated by technology, but because it's a two-way process. Just, so just say a little bit about the feedback that you've been getting. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's been mixed because I think it's, it is a time of stress. But I think Roy's point about technology is one important part, because things like booking appointments with women, where you're spending half an hour or... If you're lucky, you have half an hour with that woman as a concentrated visit. It's much easier to do online like this. You've got face-to-face. -face, it's much easier to get a good experience and that relationship. And really, Better Birth is very much about relationship with the midwife, with the woman. And so when I heard Roy talking about Better Birth so beautifully, that's music to my ears because that's, the, the sort of meat and drink of what we need for mothers and for midwives to get that relationship with the woman and her family to get all the sort of information you can get face to face I mean there are things I think you can't do as easily online because you can't kind of palpate the woman's abdomen and feel the baby and listen to the fetal hearts that that you know things will have to be done if we if we get to that point. But I think there's always a place for the face-to-face -to -face touch. We don't have to lose all of that. But what's been very interesting is that midwives have reported that their relationships with women haven't been hampered. They've talked about things like the, the, the masks and the smiley faces, smiley eyes, as being really important. And they've talked about the fact that they're able to... Um, provide home births and the home birth rate has gone up and the big thing about that has been women's women has been, have been very happy maybe they haven't chosen originally to have a home birth but because of the virus they feel safer in their own home but the wonderful thing is that the midwives and, and it's a group of midwives who may not have who may not have had the up-to-date skills in home birth have been supported in helping women with home birth and they have grown hugely themselves and have enjoyed it and have recaptured the essence of being a midwife and today is all all about being the essence of midwife i don't know if i've gone off the topic there neil because i've no, no, it's it's um, to I mean, me. <laughs> yeah. well connecting back to roy um roy mentioned the, the financial pressures that are not going to go away and um, before the breakout of the virus um roy we were beginning to see a number of standalone midwifery units being uh, closed down, things being pulled back closer to bigger hospitals, etc. And that those kind of pressures are likely to continue. Um, some of that was following um, the preferences of women, 
whether it was about safety or risk. But there does seem to be amongst a group of women a change in attitude to uh, home births. It's, it's only gone up from, I think the reports are from about 2% to 6%. But what kind of argument do you think there will be, Roy, after the, um, um, when the virus dies down and people start to try to get back to whatever normal is? Yeah, well, I, I, I'm pleased you asked me that because I, 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 my mind goes back to the uh, services that were run privately. Um, uh, there was one in North London, I think, uh, one in Manchester. I met the uh, the women that uh, uh, were running them um, because they ground to a halt because the CCGs wouldn't pay for it because the the costs were too high. But, but I mean, setting aside the fact that it's that they were privately run, they were you know NHS trained midwives, and you know they were all but NHS really. Um, but setting aside that, if you just look at the model that they were using, I thought that it was really interesting that that it was a real gold standard better births model that they were that they were working towards and and they were delivering and and the women that I met a number of the mums who you had given birth uh, through their services and they were absolutely uh, delighted with the way that they've been treated and the ongoing relationship that kind of stuff now okay fast forward to where we are now they they all they went because of financial reasons and we we just been talking haven't we about the likelihood of austerity following the the covid crisis simply because the nhs is tax funded and it will be very fragile I and mean, it's unlikely that those sort of services will be contracted for again but here's the important bit which i'm going back to the point i made earlier about leadership it's really important that midwifery leaders and leadership don't surrender to this, that we don't lose the gold standard, that we keep our eye on what is best and doing what is best. Now, I think that the the technology that Sue was just talking about, I I think a lot of the technology will actually um, uh, help the midwives uh, to be able to provide that more I- intimate relationship simply because it's you know it's on the other end of the phone it's almost like you know picking up the phone talking to your mum so I, i'm kind of optimistic so is there anyone is there anyone inventing a, a sort of uh, fitbit for checking uh, you know pulses and uh, the fitness and health yeah. Yeah. i mean is that sort of thing coming down the line that we connected to yeah. mobile I, phones self-monitoring Yes, I go every year. I go to uh, Dusseldorf in Germany to a, 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 an international health fair called Medica. It's the biggest one in the world. It's huge. It's bigger than the Birmingham Exhibition Centre. It takes days to get around it. In fact, they, you can rent a Segway to get to bicycle your way around it. Uh, it's lethal. Um, but it's all of the world's leading technology is there. And and you know what? They've got. You can do pulse oximeters plugged into this. You can do fetal heart monitoring plugged into this. In fact, they use it. Messer Sans Frontier and others are using it now. So there are extensions to the technology that we could use. And, you know, it's kind of goosebump good. And it is not expensive. That's the thing. So I'm, I'm hoping that what will come out of this disaster that it's been for so many families will be the confidence of clinicians to use the technology, the demand from the public to say, I want this technology, the technology will develop. And I think I, I'm hoping that we'll, we'll make this step forward in being able to, I mean, if you look at, look at um, being a, the coronavirus thing now, the, the, the pulse oximeter thing that you stick on your finger, that is an early indication uh, that you've got some, you've got a likelihood of a problem. Now, in order to get that on your finger, normally you'd have to go to hospital. Now you can buy one on Amazon for 20 quid, plug it into this, get the results and send them off to somebody. And they say, you know what, you're okay. You're under 92% or through 93% or whatever it is. And, and so all of that, I am optimistic. I think we have to be optimistic that, that, that good things will come of this, but it will take leadership well we've had some examples of that um, mm-hmm. Sue. we did have um i mean a lot of um home birth units and things were uh, basically shut down yeah um, availability of water births has been reduced often because the facilities have had to be used for the virus 
But in fact, we've had midwives breaking out of the lockdown, if you could call it that, by <laughs> restoring their services. Um, and we had one on the other the other day. Just say a little bit about what they did. But, well, with, uh, well, I think the, the leadership, which Roy talks about, is absolutely. And I think it's been illustrated by many midwives that we've had on on the uh, midwif midwifery and maternity hour talking about when when it all happened there was a tendency for midwifery led units especially to be closed because it wasn't seen as a potentially safe or they were being reused as a, a covid center uh, and home births because of the difficult sort of perceived difficulty of transferring a woman if there was a problem uh, was was sort of happening all over the place. But what heads of midwifery started to do was think, hang on, this isn't right. We can do something about this. Maybe women are safer in their own homes. Maybe we can put some other um, unit in place. I mean, for example, uh, my branch, uh, North Middlesex, have uh, got themselves into Tottenham Hotspur um, Stadium doing services there. So there's lots of creative ways the midwives and midwife leaders have gone about getting the services back to women the way the women will like. So it's still that personal touch. And the home birth issue and, and one of the, the leaders managed to get a, an agreement with the ambulance service. So there was strict criteria. So everybody knew what to do if there was a problem. And therefore, the home birth um, started rising, and midwifery-led units are being uh, being opened up, or a, a sort of similar arrangement for women, and obviously the, their families. So it's been very. I'd like to, us to keep that sort of very flexible nimbility. That I don't know if that's a word. Nimbleness. It's probably. a great word. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, Roy. Um, so just to um, begin to draw this uh, section to a close. So you're saying keep the focus on better births, uh, be ambitious about uh, technology, but be realistic. There is going to be a difficult uh, financial uh, environment going forward. Um, how should maternity and midwifery, because some of this does have to involve the voices of women, how can they make their voices heard more strongly to um, National government and health service leadership. Um, what would you, what would your take on, on that be? Oh, I, I would think it's it's easier now to gather public experiences and comments than it's ever been. Um, you know, again, I don't I don't want to sound like a salesman for apps and things like that, but there are all kinds of ways in which um, we can collect the thoughts of women uh, and the uh, the comments and the and the compliments and. So I, I, I'm not at all worried about how we ask the public about what their experiences have been and what they want. And of course, it has to come through the relationship between the midwife and the woman that they're dealing with. But I, I know we're coming up against the buffers of time. And I just want to say this, uh, just one thing, if I may, and that it's very important, I think, that the whole midwifery profession, uh, who, who I think have done a spectacular job uh, during these really difficult times is they should all stand up and give each other a pat on the back because I think they've done really very well. Well, uh, on that uh, note, they are in fact planning to do that today. The International <laughs> uh, Congress of Midwives is having a, a clap for midwifery at uh, 12 o'clock and we'll all be joining in. So no doubt you'll be out in your balcony, Roy. I'll be um, there. <laughs> Can I thank Roy Lilly for his uh, reflections and, as usual, plenty of stimulation and challenge uh, for the uh, future. Uh, thanks very much, Roy. Uh, take care, stay safe, behave yourself, uh, but keep giving your lovely blogs out every day and uh, keeping us informed. So uh, thanks very much to uh, Roy Lilly and we're now moving on. Thanks for watching this video from the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. For more expert opinion and analysis, hit the button below to subscribe.